morning all participants. Very happy that we can meet uh, in good health in this event. My name is Citra Helen and on this occasion I will host this event and later it will be moderated by Ms. Nina in the presentation and discussion session. I thank to all the participants who have attended and now I will read our agenda for today. The first agenda is greetings and photo session, and then followed by welcome, welcome remark from Professor Yoshi Otani, and then followed by opening remark from Professor Yasuyuki Kono, and then keynote speaker by Insinyur Hana Nugroho, MSJ, MSP, and then we start the presentation by invited speaker. I'm sorry. Uh, by invited speaker, the first speaker is Dr. Harry Yogaswara MA. The second speaker is Dr. Osamu Kozan. The third speaker is Wahyu PhD. And the uh, fourth speaker is Dr. Bambang Haryadi. And then we follow by discussion, moderated by Ms. Nina Yulian PhD. And the last the last session is closing remark from Mr. Ryuichi Fukuhara. Well, looks like there's already a lot of participants present, so let's get started. But before we start the, presenta uh, the presentation, uh, we, we, it is better to take a picture first as an archive for this agenda. Please to opening the camera and I will take the picture. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, the the first uh, session is welcome remark from Professor Yoshi Otani. Uh, he is director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Sciences, GSPS Bangkok office. To Professor Yoshi Otani, uh, time and screen are welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Yoshi Otani, director of Japan Society for the promotion of science, Bangkok office. On behalf of GSPS, uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Wafiu, Wafiu uh, Chairman of JAI, Dr. Akba Hanif Dawan, Head of Research Center of Biomass and Byproducts, Green, Professor Yasuyuki Kono, and Dr. Yuichi Fukuhara, Kyoto University for holding BioVillage Center entitled Management Policy of Petron and Mangrove uh, Sustainable Development through BioVillage Concept, organized by JAI, JSPS Alumni Association of Indonesia. JAI was established in 2016 at the uh, 17th Association among 20 JSPS alumni associations in the world. Now, JAAI grew to have 183 members, making it one of the largest and most active alumni associations in Southeast Asia. The objectives of JAI are to organize symposium and to promote scientific exchange research cultural collaborations, and to give scientific recommendations of science and technology to Indonesian government. JSPS Bangkok office was established in 1989 to develop uh, academic networks between ASEAN region and Japan. Nepal and Bangladesh Urban Association are uh, also under GSPS Bangkok office. So we have six GSPS alumni associations. Our main goals are to support the research exchange between ASEAN countries and Japan. Um, 
activities include uh, dissemination of information for GSPS fellowship and research support programs, support GSPS alumni association activities, uh, collect information on science in ASEAN, support young researchers to join GSPS programs, support research exchange of Japan universities, and collaborate various uh, organizations to promote research exchange. I hope today's seminar contribute to incorporate scientific findings into the formulation of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs policies, with research topics on food and health, new and renewable energy, environmental and related sciences, and humanity and social sciences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yoshi Otani, for the welcome remark. And then uh, opening remark from Professor Yasuyuki Kono, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, CSEAS, Kyodo University. To Professor Yasuyuki Kono, time and screen are welcome. Professor Yoshio Otani, Director of JSPS Bangkok Office, Ilhanan Nuguroroho, Chief Planner of Energy and Environment, Dr. Nas, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to deliver opening remarks in this wonderful occasion. Let me also express my sincere gratitude to the organizer of this bio seminar. Dr. Wafio Divanto. I came to know him more than 10 years ago. Since then, we had a lot of chances to work together. I always highly appreciate his efforts and enthusiasm as a researcher, as well as as a coordinator. Today, I'd like to mainly talk about what roles we, researchers, are expected to do and how just it, for which I have served as a PI since the beginning, try to promote and support the activities of researchers as opening remarks. In October 20, uh, 2019, before the spread of coronavirus, we held Japan Indonesia Directors Conference at Hiroshima, Japan. More than 70 delegates from 36 universities and the government agency of Indonesia, and almost the same number of delegates from 33 Japanese universities gathered. I attended the conference as a representative of Kyoto University. Under the topic of collaboration in research and education for sustainable and peaceful society, we spent two days for exchanging information, ideas, and plans. One of the keynote, keynote speakers of the conference was Professor Takashi Shiraishi. He is former professor of my center, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and one of the most prominent researchers on Indonesia in particular, and on Asia in general. He is one of the most influential academicians on Japanese foreign policies and served for the cabinet of the central government in various occasions. What he said in the keynote was that first, Indonesia will be one of the major powers in the world by 2045. And second, the goals of Indonesia by then should be to achieve prosperity, security, and freedom. In the current world, the US and China may be the superpowers. US achieved prosperity and freedom, but not security. China achieved prosperity 
and security, but not freedom. His message was that Indonesia has a great potentiality to achieve all of them, which leads Indonesia to be one of the major powers in the world. We are now observing the process of for Indonesia to step up one of the major powers in the world, I think. Your president vigorously meets with world leaders and try to find out the way to overcome the current crisis of peacekeeping, food security, and economic recession for the whole human society. I highly appreciate his and his team's efforts and I sincerely hope the success of the G20 summit at Bali this October, in which your president served as a chair. Let us go back to our issues, as I am not a specialist of international relations. Although Professor Shirai pointed out three goals, let me add one more, healthy environment. I believe that to achieve healthy environment is equally important to achieve other three goals, particularly for Indonesia. This is not only for the people and the society of Indonesia, but even from the global perspectives. Indonesian environmental issues are undoubtedly one of the central of the global environmental issues in terms of both climate change and biodiversity. The contemporary society faces a wide range of common issues. The environmental issue is, of course, one of them. Besides, we have issues on economic disparity, natural disaster, pandemic, peacekeeping, among others. All of these issues have multifaceted factors and need interdisciplinary approaches. All of these issues cannot be solved neither by modern and standardized knowledge, nor traditional and local knowledge. We always have to seek for the best mix of various kinds of knowledge to cope with the issues. All of these issues have multiple layers from the household and the community levels to the national and global levels. And different layers have different set of factors behind available knowledge and stakeholders. Now the question is, how can we link these different layers to synthesize global and local? I believe that Researcher should be one of the main players to link the multiple layers. Village leaders may be strong at grassroots society, but not at the national and global levels. Government officers may be strong at the local and the national levels, but not at the grassroots and global levels. Researchers can cover all the layers, consider various factors and knowledge, examining constraints and logics of different layers and stakeholders, and propose the suitable and feasible solutions. It is, of course, difficult to do this by individual researcher, but we can do this by partnership, networking, and integrated approach, as you mentioned in the background of this seminar. What can be the key questions to link multiple layers, to incorporate various factors, to integrate various kinds of knowledge, and to synthesize global and local? These are just examples, and there must be much more. But let me raise four questions here. First, how can we better connect the knowledge and the power of local communities to larger decisions and global dynamics. Second, how can we better incorporate the globally shared technology and institutions 
in the optimization of local communities. Third, how can we reinforce and realize the potentialities of nature while controlling and managing it in coordination with human society? Fourth, how is plural coexistence of cultural, social, religious, and other differences possible? I believe that these questions are important for this BioBerit seminar too. Let me briefly explain about JASTIP, which support this seminar. JASTIP, or Japan National Science, Technology, and Innovation Platform, was launched in September 2015, aiming at establishing a sustainable platform for Japan ASEAN collaboration of science, technology, and innovation towards SDGs. The idea behind it is, first, sharing networks of researchers as a basis of promoting transdisciplinary researches and enhancing human development, including non-academic stakeholders. And second, promoting in-situ research research at the place where the issue exists to incorporate the social and the environmental complexity of issue. These are similar to what I said for synthesizing global and local. The core institute of justice consists of Kyoto University as the headquarter, National Science and Technology Development Agency, NASDA, in Thailand, in the field of environmental and energy, National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN, in Indonesia, in the field of bioresources and biodiversity, and Malaysia Japan International Institute of Technology, MJIIT, in the field of disaster prevention and risk reduction. This is managed by Kyoto University professors of relevant fields, together with their counterpart. But we are sure that the research community is much bigger and the core organization can cover only a part of it. To overcome this limitation and to achieve sharing networks of researchers and promoting institute research, we developed a scheme called JustipNet. Through JustipNet, we connect ourselves with universities research institute and SDGs research communities in Japan and ASEAN. We started this in 2016 and have already connected with more than 200, 200 universities and research institutes. The application procedure is as follows. We open call for application once a year in which we identify the research theme of each WP. In the last call opened in the beginning of this year, WP1 proposed a research theme that facilitating dialogues between scientists, researchers, and policymakers to embed scientific findings into the SDGs policy formulation in line with just a research focus, to which Dr. Wafio applied. This year, we received in total 109 applications from Japan and all the ASEAN member countries, except for Singapore, and selected 31 applications. Dr. Fafiu's proposal linking bio concept concept studies with peatland and mangrove management policy was successfully adopted. Congratulations. So I sincerely hope that Today's seminar would be a productive and fruitful occasion for all the participants to connect your research with policy formation on peatland and mangrove. Before closing, let me add one more point. We all know that peatland and mangrove are precious and fragile ecosystems. How to manage, how to utilize, and how to conserve them are quite important questions, but quite difficult to answer. 
there must be no single answer for which is not a true single answer. Rather, we should share various answers to these questions, learn each other, and improve our commitment. I believe that this is the way to go. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yasuyuki Kono. On this occasion, we will say thank you very much to Professor Yoshi Otani and Professor Yasuyuki Kono uh, for the willingness to give the welcome remark and opening remark at, at this event. Uh, we will show the certificate of having uh, par participated and the committee will display it. Thank you very much, Otani Sensei, Ono Sensei. Otsukare sama deshita. Well, the next session is moderated by Ms. Nina, PhD. To Ms. Nina, uh, we invite to start the session. Thank you. Speakernya, Bu. Speaker, please. Hello. Okay. 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 Good morning, uh, Bapak dan Ibu, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet all of you in this seminar. My name is Nina Yulianti. I come from the Pitland site in Central Kalimantan, and uh, I also the faculty member in University of Palangkaraya. I believe uh, those of us attending this event are more concerned about pitland, mangrove, and other related issues. Pitland have the highest carbon density of the any terrestrial ecosystem on the planet. So as Asia pitland has involved over thousands of years with the oldest beginning around 20,000 years old. Indonesia has the most peatland in Asia and even Asia. Peat swamp conversion in Indonesia caused the extensive drainage and fire is frequently used to open land and remove unwanted biomass in preparation, in, in pre -pre -pre preparation for the planting in the agriculture. So mangrove also, on the other hand, is the one of carbon storage in the marine and coastal ecosystem. However, in the last decade, we also lost mangrove area due to various human activity and also natural disaster. Those issues not only disturb the climate system due to greenhouse emissions, but it also has the impact on the local community livelihood. This seminar will present the concept of the bio village. This concept must provide an alternative way for the community daily economic activity. Bio village development based on biodiversity in peat and also mangrove ecosystem necessitates community participant in order to generate community daily income and do not rely on the one community plantations. As the green economic base, this concept is a high public awareness and also importance for the sustainability. So from now, we will hear like policy, various experiences, and research finding from great speaker. There will be three sessions. The keynote address will be delivered by Bapak Hanan first. Good morning, Bapak Hanan. Are you ready to join for, with us? 
Halo, Bapak Anan. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Bapak. Nice to meet you. And the second is the four well-known scientists from Japan and Indonesia were invited to speech. I would like to greet uh, Kojan Sensei in this morning. So are you ready to share the presentation, Sensei? Okay. Ah, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, good morning also for Bapak Dr. Heri, Bapak Dr. Wahyudi, and Bapak Dr. Bambang Haryadi. Uh, it, it is a honor for me to guide you in this seminars. Good morning, moderator. Thank you. Good morning, Bapak. Okay. And our final session will be a discussion. And during the event, all participants are permitted to write their questions in the chat box. And then we will open the floor to oral question from selected participants. So when you submit your questions, please don't forget include your name and your institutions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before presentation begin, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker from Bapenas. Bapak Hanan will talk about policy of peatland and mangrove in Indonesia. He is a chief planner with National Development Planning, or we know in Indonesia, Bapenas. Uh, also, he graduated from ITB, from Michigan Technology University, from Institute Francis du Petrol, and the Kyoto University also. He, he had experience as the senior researcher fellow at Harvard Kennedy School in the US. So the presentation time is around 30 minutes, Bapak. If you are need assistance during this seminar, uh, let us know. So Bapak, the time is yours now. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bunina, uh, distinguished Professor Yusio Otani, JSBS Bangkok, Professor Suzuki Kono, CS, uh, CSAS, Kyoto University, member JSPS uh, Alumni Association of Indonesia, all the participants of this conference. Please allow me to read a kind of speech I have been asked for. And mangroves and pits are very important for Indonesia, but challenges are still there. Mangroves are not just plants. They are the guardians of livelihoods, especially for local people surrounding the areas. Grow on the river mouth and along some coastline, mangroves serve as a barrier to abrasion of seawater while reducing the risk of floods. The ecosystem of mangroves provides food, fishes, and protection for shorelines from disasters such as tsunamis and storms in addition to reducing flood risks in addition and erosion. Pitlands are among the most valuable ecosystems on Earth. Occupying only about 3% of the Earth's land surface, peatlands are our largest carbon store on land. The peatlands serve a remarkable being which includes the provision of wildlife habitat, biodiversity, good water quality, flood prevention, historical artists, recreational areas, and so on. Indonesia is blessed with extensive mangroves and peatlands areas scattered through the country, in the archipelago, mangrove and peatlands, Papua province in the east has the widest area, which is about 1.6 million hectares for mangroves and about 6.3 million hectares for peatlands. On the world scale, Indonesian mangrove forests are about 22% of the world, while Indonesia peat with an area of 20.2 million hectares is the world's second largest after Brazil. Indonesian mangrove is the most diverse in the world with about 100 through mangrove species. This saw that what happened to the management of mangrove and peatland in Indonesia will have far-reaching effects not only in Southeast Asia, 
but also in the world. Mangroves on pits have enormous potential for environmental services. Peatlands globally store twice the carbon stored in forests. Mangroves and pits might help mitigate the impact of climate change as they store a much larger amount of carbon than the highland forest could do. In Indonesia itself, theoretically, the ability is even sufficient to absorb carbon emission produced by all motorized vehicles in the country. But unfortunately, Indonesia has not been able to maintain the natural wealth of it and mangrove properly. We are experiencing significant mangrove loss annually. The majority of loss is driven by mangroves being converted into agriculture pond, for example, in Java and Sulawesi. And due to coastal development and urban expansion on several islands, a lot of opalons are lost due to development of oil palm plantation, most in Sumatra and Kalimantan. Some sources say Indonesia has lost about half of its mangroves over uh, in, in the last three decades. For peatlands, an area fallen to or perhaps more than the destroyed mangroves has also been lost due to land conservation and forest fires. Uh, dear uh, participant, uh, about the current policies. In 2017, the president of Indonesia is a presidential regulation number 59 of 2017 concerning the implementation of achieving sustainable development goals. Among the 17 goals to be achieved, mangroves can contribute to achievement of SDG 1, no poverty, SDG 2, no hunger, SDG 13, about climate change, SDG 14, life below water, and SDG 15, life on land. Meanwhile, PIT can play a role in achieving SDG 1, SDG 8, about decent work and economic growth, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, SDG 12, what responsible consumption and production, SDG 13 and NDG 15. In 2016, Indonesia ratified the Paris Agreement, submitted its NDC, nationally determined contribution, and even have uh, then updated it. To fulfill the Paris Agreement's commitment to preventing the increase in the Earth's temperature, the role of mangrove and peat was mentioned as a very prominent in reducing carbon dioxide emission. The government of Indonesia is working to enhance the protection of mangrove and peat, for instance, by introducing special plans, a system for resolving land use conflicts, and balancing environmental and economic consideration by delineating zones for specific uses. In the national Medium term development planning 2024, the government set an ambitious target of rehabilitating some 600,000 hectares of mangroves by 2024. The government has also included labor intensive micro restoration as part of the country's national recovery program. In the national context, the primary national policy regulation mangrove and peatland is law number 32 of 2009 on environmental conservation and management. There are also international agreements and guidelines related to mangrove and peatland that the government in Indonesia has ratified, including the Ramsar Convention of Wetland of International Importance and the Convention of Bio Biological Defense. In 2020, the government in Nisa established the pit and mangrove restoration, expanding its role, which was originally only released in mangrove and pit management. Um, now about the uh, future, more conservation, restoration, and innovative policy and implementation is needed. Of course, in the future, we in Indonesia have to be better. In addition to the current one, several policies need to be developed. Conservation and restoration of the mangrove and pit environment is a strategy policy that must be added to. Despite facing the demand for 
of economic development in Indonesia, where not all of its inhabitants' life is prosperity, policies must consider the cost and benefit of development programs, including for mangroves and peat. We regret ever trying to develop a food estate on pit land. It later turned out to be more harmful. Similarly, developing energy sources from mangroves and pet may result in larger emission than the energy benefit they may provide. In 2025, Indonesia will initiate the long-term development plan 2025 to 2045. In the long-term plan, low carbon development, including net zero emission, will be prioritized. This includes better management of mangrove and pet. Although we have developed inventory, planning and control, and recovery of our mangrove and pet ecosystem, due to the, their very vast territory, these works might not be effective enough. So far, a number of regulations regarding mangrove and pet have been developed, but their implementation is still ineffective and inconsistent, partly due to the lack of understanding among the organizations responsible for this in the government, especially in the region, lack of fund and weak technology support and innovation. We need to overcome the limitations that have been encountered so far and make new innovation. In protecting mangrove and pet, we will need more accurate, comprehensive, and frequently updated data that can be used to track the process of development, communicate, and prioritize action. We also need to work collaboratively among the government, scientists, economics, NGOs, and communities. Coordination and consultation among government institutions and other stakeholders to improve mangrove and pit ecosystem need to be improved. Knowledge in this area should be disseminated more widely. Scientists and researchers not only conduct research and publish academic papers, but also papers that are easier for public to understand, especially decision makers and politicians, such as in the form of a policy papers on a policy brief. To give uh, an example of good innovation, in October 2020, uh, Lipia uh, Brain Red launched Mon Mang, a mobile application that enabled communities to collect, process, and analyze mangrove data. Communities in coastal areas can send real time data on mangroves to the application, bridging the gap between citizens and research in the laboratory. Another good innovation is brings development of the mangrove health index, which only a few countries in the world are doing similarly. We are now again initiated by a green and sponsored also by uh, GSPS, uh, developing the concept of management and policy of peatland and mangrove sustainable development through biofilage. We will elaborate on the concept and see what they have been implemented related to local knowledge, the concept of tropical country, education, and sustainable development. Enjoy the conference. Thank you for your attention. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you, Bapa Hanan, for your excellent sharing information. We know government policy is an important key to save the remaining peatlands and also mangrove in Indonesia in the sustainable way. So we hope Indonesia can achieve SDGs agenda and also zero emission in the several years later. Okay, let me move to the first invitations speaker, Dr. Harry Yogaswara is the head of the research organization Archaeology, Language and Literature of Brins. This is one of research center dealing with the manuscript, literature, and oral traditions. Currently, Dr. Harry is senior researcher on the humans, ecology, and populations. Also in environmental cluster of the research center of the populations. Uh, he completed his study from Pajajaran University 
and then from Ateneo de Manila University, Philippines, and then the PhD from University of Indonesia. He research interests are related to indigenous issue, resource management, ethnicity, and also conflict. He published two volume books uh, with the title Prevention of Culture Heritage of Banten Lama Site a political economic study, and also he published many scientific articles in the international and also national. Bapa, we expect your presentation will be 50 minutes. If you are need assistance, let us know. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Harry. Silakan Bapa. Thank you, moderator. <coughs> Can you see the 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 file I share? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, every everybody. Very good morning. Thank you uh, for uh, the organizer to invite me as a speaker <coughs> for this uh, session. Uh, learning from Professor Korno and also Pahanan. I think my presentation is more easy because I learn from. Two of them, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because my, however, my perspective maybe is quite different. Uh, I, I don't talk about uh, something uh, physical, yeah. Because my background is anthropology, and then I think I will uh, talk more about the uh, uh, social culture and etc. <clears throat> uh, actually, uh, this is a funny thing. Uh, what I say funny because. I think, uh, let's say three months ago, I I, I was working in the, uh, what so-called research center for population as a human ecologist. But right now, I am heading of the research organization of archaeology, language, and literature. It's quite quite different, I think, my expertise. But anyway, in one research center, we have research center for manuscript uh, and also oral tradition. That's why. For this morning, I would like to talk about uh, one part of oral tradition related with the local knowledge. <clears throat> and then if we talk about the peatland and mangrove ecosystem, uh, to be easy, I use the term PME, uh, uh, peatland and mangrove ecosystem. But my perspective is more eco-hydrology perspective. Yeah? Uh, if we use the eco-hydrology perspective, actually, that perspective try to combine what so-called uh, human uh, nature and culture perspective. That's why if we talk about eco-hydrology, about the peatland and mangrove ecosystem, actually, in my point of view, we talk about the arena while human culture and ecosystem interact each other. Yeah, And then uh, as the Professor Kono Pahanan said earlier, uh, the peatland and mangrove ecosystem in Indonesia is uh, very important, yeah? especially in the outer island. If we talk outer island, we call non-Java island, such as Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Papua. And then peatland ecosystem composed more than 20, 24 million hectares. Yeah? I use data from 2017. However, I think in the danger condition, yeah? uh, one data set more than 98% is classified a danger, yeah, due to forest fire, uh, human made <clears throat> digging for canal, and also <clears throat> changing for forest coverage. In this situation, my question is how local knowledge can be used, yeah, in in this uh, uh, danger situation, in the threatening situation because of the palm oil and etc. And then, before I explain uh, more detail about the policy. Uh, I would like to mention some various technology, terminology related with the local knowledge, because I think some scholars use traditional knowledge, indigenous technical knowledge, vernacular knowledge, and also traditional and fundamental knowledge. Yeah? And also some other scholars using a uh, notion of local knowledge, such as indigenous knowledge, local genius, local with local wisdom, and so on. There are many uh, terminologies 
because the terminology come from different ideology and different theoretical perspective. Just like myself, actually I am very rare. Yeah, use term local wisdom. I prefer use the term local uh, knowledge because if we talk local knowledge, it's mean the hybrid knowledge between what so called local indigenous and also what so called modern technology in one area. That's I think my uh, position related with the local knowledge. Yeah. And then uh, one another scientist say local knowledge actually refer to a, a collection of information that it passed down from generation to generation in a local interlocality and is acquired through accumulated experience, relationship with surrounding environment and traditional ritual practices and institution. Maybe to be short, I, I, I use the terminology using by IIRR, International Institute for Rural Reconstruction in the Philippines. They said, if we talk about the local knowledge, actually talk about knowledge passed down from one generation to another, and also experiential. That's very important, the term experiential. Uh, meaning to say, if we talk about local knowledge, that also already uh, happened in one community. Okay, and then I would like to also problematizing of local indigenous and, and wisdom, because I think in in the social science uh, debate, actually uh, there are two, uh, uh, three ter terminology are uh, discussed. Yeah, uh, first local, second indigenous, and another is wisdom. Yeah. And local wisdom is defined uh, the knowledge owned by certain community, which is past experience from generation and unique from one community to others. Yeah, and then but if we talk about the local wisdom, in my, my point of view, there is a, like a judgment. Yeah, judgment. That's the knowledge is uh, using wisely. Yeah, uh, uh, from community, yeah? but. I think in the reality, because of the uh, what is social and cultural changing, actually the the term local uh, the term wisdom is become debatable and also subjectivity, because wisdom for me may be different with wisdom with Professor Kono or Pawahyu because we have different perspective to see the phenomena in the field. Yeah, uh, that's why. I think also the term indigenous, yeah, actually that's related with the what so called indigenous people movement. I think in the 1992, in the Earth Conference, the term is uh, occurred, and then also many activists using the term indigenous. But the problem also about the indigenous, what is indigenous is? Uh, I mean, uh, indigenous also something subjectivity, yeah, how we can define. The community using the term indigenous while they while they still also experience with the modern education and etc. That's why I think uh, if we talk about the, that uh, prob problematization of local indigenous and wisdom, I think we can uh, see something uh, uh, interesting, yeah, important also if we see in the community level. Because I think I learned from Professor Konos uh, about this presentation. Actually, we need talk from the global, national, uh, regional, until the what so called local perspective. That I think is very important terminology also. And then I would like to, <coughs> uh, I think not really introduce, but I really like to use the framework. The name framework is Link, yeah. That's from UNESCO. Yeah, links stand for local and indigenous knowledge system. In the uh, what this framework by UNESCO, yeah, actually this framework is uh, using for the issues related with disaster risk reduction, DRR, and climate change adaptation. If we talk about the framework local and indigenous system or links, yeah, actually divided into four categories. First, 
local and indigenous knowledge that scientifically proven and also can be used for development program. Yeah, uh, I have an example about this, uh, just like the education uh, related with disaster in Aceh. They use the what this the example of smong. Smong mean, meaning tsunami in the local level, but how they they use uh, this uh, uh, term smong for policy because there are many research already and proven the smong in Aceh is uh, usually the collective memory of the uh, tsunami uh, happened in 1907. Yeah, that already scientifically proven. Not only just uh, uh, oral tradition. And second, uh, there is a scientific, there is a local and indigenous knowledge scientifically proven, but not used for development program. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there are many examples related with this. Uh, what I say, not really using for development. Some research already happened, but not implemented to the development uh, program. And then the third category, the links scientifically not proven, yeah, but can use be can be used for development program. That's actually many uh, what I uh, experience in the field. That actually related with the some folklore related with in Bahasa we call pantun, proverb, and other uh, folk tale. Uh, that actually related with the how to conserve the the what is the environment but not uh, 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 but used for the develop not not really uh, proven yet but already used for uh, a development uh, program just like uh, in peraturan daerah in Yogyakarta related with the, with management disaster management actually the they use uh some uh, proffered or pantun but not really scientifically proven but they use already and then the four category related to scientifically not proven that and cannot be used for development program but for us for us for anthropology whatever local knowledge for us very important to collect maybe we cannot prove uh, 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 this uh, situation but maybe another situation or Maybe if we have a, a more uh, infant technology, we can scientifically proven uh, all the the what is the practices, yeah. And then what policy should be? Of course, we cannot uh, have one single policy, yeah. If we related with the category number one, I think we need to promoting policy research. But the important is how to interlink between research and policy making process. That I think this the situation in Indonesia. While researcher uh, did a good research, but we fail to deliver to the to the policy maker. Yeah, and also in the category two, how to integrate? Yeah, what people perception about their environment and local development plan, and then for the third category, how the result of research as knowledge production should intensively discuss further possibility apply for other development program. And then for category four, the documentation of link is important for knowledge production, but maybe a possibility related with advanced technology in the future. I, I mean, if we talk about the policy brief or policy paper, uh, uh, for sure, we cannot use the single uh, solution. Yeah, we, we need to have some option uh, for policy that related with the the condition of the local knowledge. Okay, I think Pak uh, Pak Kanan already mentioned about some uh, policy related with uh, uh, mangrove and peatland ecosystem, but I think related with the local knowledge. Actually, the in the Indonesia government uh, through the Minister Lingkungan Hidup and Kehutanan, I think already uh, launched yeah several policy, but. One policy I, I really like to mention here, number uh, 34 in 2017, related with the acknowledge 
uh, uh, regulation, acknowledgement, and protection of local wisdom on management of natural resources and environment. Meaning to say, government, national government has policy already related with the what so called local knowledge. Yeah. Uh, however, the terminology uh, used are local wisdom and local knowledge. Yeah. In Bahasa, we call karifan local and pengetahuan tradisional. Why this regulation using the two terminologies? Because I think this regulation related with the genetic resources that related with also with the Nagoya protocol. That's why. But uh, I think we can still use this uh, regulation for implementation of the program. And also, I think some uh, local knowledge is also mentioned in several district regulation related to management of disaster and regulation to protect local practices. Yeah. So far, I remember Kanun in Aceh, also the, uh, the, uh, the city regulation in Jogja related disaster, and also uh, regulation in Central Kalimantan uh, mentioned about the the what is the the local regulation. Uh, provincial or district level. Okay, so uh, I think in this situation, in this uh, present, uh, show some example because I think some other uh, presenter will talk about the case study. But if we talk local knowledge related with the peatland and mangrove ecosystem, yeah, they are fa uh, very, yeah, just like a traditional zoning system. Because if we talk about the traditional uh, zoning system, this is related with the history and customary arrangement. Also related with tenure system in the petland area. Uh, that also water management and sacred and uh, secret uh, uh, knowledge. And if we talk about the mangrove uh, ecosystem, I think uh, the local knowledge will be related with traditional zoning system tenure system and also community arrangement related to mangrove area and also sacred area and secret uh, knowledge. That's if we talk a sacred area and secret knowledge, actually we also talk about the protection uh, about this uh, uh, matter. Okay, uh, I think in this uh, about this uh, presentation, I would like uh, pose to policy recommendation. First, re research on uh, peatland and mangrove ecosystem related to local knowledge should integrate with policy making processes and link should categories aim for scientific explanation and implementation for development purposes. Secondly, identification local knowledge that not yet proven scientifically and has not related to development program is also important for further analysis, especially for us for uh, research related with culture, the identification of local knowledge is still very important to, to be researched uh, for the uh, next future. I, that's all I think for, that's all the, my presentation, moderator, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Harry. <clears throat> we can learn from your sharing how the local community and their local knowledge can be powerful actors in preserving our environments, particularly in the pitland and also mangrove. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our second invited uh, speaker is the Associate Professor Osamo Kozan. He is a researcher from Center of South East Asia, Kyoto University. He was a also the associate professor in the uh, Research Institute for Humanity and Nature's RINS. His education backgrounds, uh, uh, PhD, uh, undergraduate and also PhD from the Kyoto University Graduate School of Engineering. Currently his research interest is tropical peatland management and transboundary air pollution. Uh, and he has con has been conducting research for many years in peatland in Sumatra and also in Kalimantan. As sensei, your presentation will be 50 minutes. If you are need any assistance, just yeah. Okay. The, so 
time is yours, Sensei. Please. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Nina. So, can you hear me? Yeah, very oh, well. Okay, okay, okay. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, I a little bit hesitate to make a presentation because I am not a political scientist. But very, this seminar is a very good opportunity to share our collaboration activity for more than 12 years in Sumatra, uh, Riau province. This picture shows the seminar held last December in Tanjuraban village. So uh, red uh, uh, shirts, uh, uh, this uh, Dr. Harris is my old uh, counterpart, old friend of counterpart. So, okay, so maybe most of you know uh, tropical peatland. So tropical peatland, so 20% global soil carbon, or how to conserve them, it's an important issue, not only in Indonesia, but also in all over the world. Okay, this is the photo of my research target village. So it's a, a tropical peatland. But many part of peatland were developed into acacia plantation and also developed into oil palm plantation. After deforestation and drainage, uh, Feng and Chigaya, uh, Pakistan, Arang Arang, Bahasa Indonesia, uh, grow in many, many places. And this condition is very dangerous. So such land is vulnerable to fire. There are uh, several fire every few years. So here are some photos of our activities in 2010 and 2011. I started my research in 2010. It's a precious memory for me. So I installed uh, rain gauge and also uh, soil sample, uh, peat sample with um, Dr. Harris. And also we construct uh, eco hute, eco house in Bukit Batu Biosphere Reserve area. And uh, we, we went to there with local villages and make, make discussion. And also I started uh, where construction with villages. They are uh, now their main counterpart and main, um, main member of Peter and Restoration in this village. So also uh, we started uh, groundwater level monitoring with villagers. Okay, let me move to uh, our concept. So based on the result of field survey in 2010 and 11, we defined the vulnerability of this area as follows. So um, some professor already uh, analyzed Maraya people and their land use, uh, customary land use. So uh, we like to say there are two vulnerabilities. So ecological vulnerable and social vulnerable. So uh, our project focused on these two vulnerabilities. For example, ecologically vulnerable. So there are some problem to restore a uh, degraded peatland. Restoration is very difficult. We need well planned land management and planting based on technology and indigenous knowledge. In this project, I support supported technological part, technical part, and try to withdraw villagers' indigenous local knowledge. Like this, yeah, we already done several projects, uh, water management, uh, breeding, uh, indigenous native seedling, land management and wildlife management with local villagers. Tanjun Laban Rewetting Deforestation Site is located on the north coast of Sumatra. Tanjun Laban is very close to Malaysia and Singapore. Tanjuraba is surrounded by red line in this figure, and it is about 47,000 hectares, which was covered with forest until 1990s. The north part uh, officially so now belonging to Dumai city area, Kota Dumai area, but uh, local people think 
they are officially do my area people, but uh, they are also uh, Tanjiro Raman people. <laughs> so a little bit complicated area. And also this blue line. There is an industrial acacia plantation company, Bebe Ha, uh, related uh, company under uh, APP and Shinanamas Group. So, uh, cooperation with uh, private company is one of the most important things to, for water management. We survey land use change from 1979 to 2010. Green area is peat swamp forest. This is a land use map of 2010. You can see that acacia plantation is located about five kilometers from the sea. And the land up to uh, acacia plantation, this area uh, is well burned. So many wildfire between this area. So our research target is this area, well burned area. So uh, after negotiation with JICA and the Indonesian government, so we are we we are supported by JICA. We call it JPP, J JICA Partnership Project, but started in 2017. Main counterpart are Diao University, Professor Almasri and BRG, uh, Dr. Harris. So JPP concept is water management by elevation. We made hydro river map cooperate with uh, Shinanomas group. So they have LIDAR elevation information. So we use their uh, elevation data. You can see Akashia plantation area on the upstream of Tanjun Laban River. Uh, this area is very flat. They can manage very well, but uh, this village area is very steep. So we need some uh, infrastructure to keep groundwater and uh, surface water. This is a concept. So water management by elevation per meter, per, per one meter. So zone A, zone B, zone C until E. So every uh, zone separately, so we control same water level. Let me introduce uh, so area. This is a map of rewetting reforestation site. Ten years ago, we were constructed separately. I started uh, uh, yeah, we are dam construction, but one by one. One by one is sometimes no almost no meaning. So, but water management needs to be done watershed scale, like this. The main target is is more than 1,000 hectares, around uh, 1,000 hectares. And the water supplied from uh, Akasha plantation area. And until JPP project, company don't share their water information. But now we try to construct a uh, cooperation uh, system relationship. So first step, uh, we uh, local people learn uh, hydrological monitoring system, monitoring method. So understanding local information by villagers and installation of simple infrastructure like this. And second step, after April 2019, so sharing water information with upstream company and creating a regional management system, cooperation system with the company. And, and third step is understanding water and land ownership. And land ownership in this area is very complicated. More than 40% of land is uh, non villagers land. So how to negotiate with landowner is uh, one of the key uh, issue in this area. Okay, so um, there are 90 river flow monitoring point, monitoring system uh, managed by villagers. The villager can understand uh, how much water they use and uh, when uh, water level is low and flood will come. So, and this is a sample of first wear supported by uh, University of Riau, Riau University. 
and second uh, where now our where uh, dam is improving so uh, water level can be controlled by using a board like this okay let me move to my summary and conclusion so a water and vegetation management plan was made for 1200 hectare in Tanjiraman village 12 where so this very small uh, green light green point is where uh, was constructed and total three three uh, thirty three point four hectare of indigenous tree planting were uh, <coughs> done by 19 household like this so uh, 19 household support join our uh, project so first he's a leader number one household uh, plant Fry, Karet, Baram, Gahar, Maha, Mahoni, Lami, Bintango, Gurengon, uh, Meranti, Matoa. So that kind of, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, uh, recommend that kind of uh, tree, but uh, local people select by themselves. And summary number two. So we there have been almost no fire since the JICA project started. And the villagers are now taking the initiative in peat land management. As the risk of fire and flood has decreased, some villagers are to their traditional livelihood, like a forestry and fishing. Instead of oil palm monoculture cultivation, the villagers have selected a plant indigenous tree species in high risk area. High risk means high uh, fire risk area and to grow vegetable and oil palm in low risk area, low fire risk area. The villagers are trying to diversify their livelihood in order to achieve both environmental co conservation and livelihood improvement. And publicity activity has been conducted by villagers, uh, Bear Game and the counterpart and uh, Iria University. Our activity is getting famous in this area. Uh, although some report don't include the name of Kyoto University and JICA. Yeah, it's a little bit pity, but I think it's very good. Also, uh, I think it's very good things because the initiative has been transferred to Indonesian side. So Kyoto University has only assisted uh, with the initial activities. And now Gileja company continue this activity. And I hope um, this comes this activity continue in near will continue in near future okay thank you this is the result of our 12 years uh, collaboration thank you for your attention and long-term support okay <clears throat> thank you uh, kozan sensei for your interesting presentations we believe that long-term collaborations research between you and dr harris and the Rio University, funded by Japanese government and also scientists, will be beneficial to Indonesian tropical peatland and also our community. Okay. Before we move to the other uh, speaker, I would like to remind all of participants: if you have the question to Bapak Hanan, Bapak Harry, and also Dr. Kozan. Please uh, submit in the chat box, and then we will read your uh, question during the discussion sessions. Okay. Uh, next, I would like to uh, welcome our third uh, invitation, invite, invite speakers, Bapak Wahyudi. Bapak Wahyudi is a professor from Faculty of Forestry, University of Papua. He graduated from the Uni Universitas Cendrawasi and then uh, University of Melbourne, Australia, and then PhD from Ehime University, Japan. He has published several prominent articles and then on mangrove topics, include social economic impact of mangrove and study on clan right compensation and village development program of mangrove a uh, concession at Bintuni Bay. And then uh, he, a member of academic papers and also PERDA, the 
provincial uh, regulation on the development and man management of mangrove ecosystem in the province of Papua. Bapak, we expect your presentation will be 50 minutes. Uh, so the floor is yours right now, please. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Good morning, everyone. This morning, uh, I would like to present the mangrove policy paper from uh, West Papua province, entitled of Protecting and Empowering Coastal Indigenous Communities Under Mangrove Essential Ecosystem Regulation in West Papua province. So this mangrove policy actually is the result of collaboration uh, from Agency for Research and Innovation Center in Waspa Province, uh, Ekonusa Indonesia, Faculty of Forestry, University of Papua in Manokwari, and also other stakeholders like we call uh, Mitra Pembangunan Berkelanjutan in West Papua Province. So uh, there is at least uh, three fact of importance why mangrove uh, policy maker is made. And the first fact of importance that 90% uh, of West Papua province is forest cover and coastal areas consisting of 4,500 islands from small to big, populated or unpopulated where indigenous community are live in and rely on these resources. The second fact of importance is that this province has the second largest mangrove resources in Indonesia. And this mangrove is distributed at 11 of 13 districts. And it is as a natural burial and vulnerable from any climate change phenomena and also consequences. The last fact of importance is that West Papua province has commitment to sustain 70% of forest cover area, to carry sustainable development base, to develop green economic, green economy and local wisdom based products. And these are accommodated on Perdasus number 10, 2019 for pembangunan berkelanjutan in Papua Barat province and also Perdasus number 9, 2019 for acknowledgement, protection and empowerment of indigenous communities, the customer right and the customer land area in West Papua province. So the philosophy of a mangrove policy, make, policy paper in West Papua province, it will be mangrove resources, protection, Coachman, empowerment, indigenous communities, local wisdom or local knowledge, climate change mitigation, indirect participation of local community, and also conservation. Uh, this map shows the distribution of mangrove resources in West Papua province in 2019. So, West Papua province has approximately 480,000 hectares of mangrove and mostly uh, concentrate on the southern part of this province area. And here we can see the black spot here is this uh, mangrove habitat. And for the purple, the heavy purple is uh, indicated for conservation, uh, protection, and also preserve area. So mostly uh, look at on the coastal areas. So at least there are four, yeah, four noble mission for mangrove essential ecosystem policy, policy paper in West Papua. The number one is to protect mangrove resources and be designed as a mangrove essential ecosystem. The second noble mission will be to seal 
coach and empower the mangrove ecosystem with a biotic and abiotic constituent, including local communities live in, own, and use this ecosystem. The third noble mission is to safeguard sustainable existence, solidity, functionality, and also usefulness of mangrove ecosystem, either for local, national, and international agenda, as well as to acknowledge the customer right of the indigenous communities. And the fourth noble mission is to offer justice and ownership to the customer clan related to the indigenous knowledge practices and also livelihood dependency. This mangrove policy will cover, for example, management, utilization, protection of mangrove space, biodiversity conservation, coaching local and indigenous communities, with local knowledge, utilization and management, assertion of social culture and customer right ownership and practices, education and training for mangrove human resources, environmental service taxation, retribution, green funding, and also auditing. Proposing and activities designed for mangrove essential ecosystem. For, for what kind of activities designed for mangrove essential ecosystem? It could be environmental services, ecotourism based, creative or green economy based product, biophilic based product, any productive activities. But there are also uh, limitation for a mangrove essential ecosystem, for example, this prohibited for exploitation and exploration. And the targeted indigenous community could be individual, traditional institution, group of women or youth organization, village on legal entities, micro, small, and medium enterprises. And there is also procedure how to get mangrove essential ecosystem permits. So it should be proposed to the governor and with uh, some supplement document needed and field, sur field survey uh, will be conducted collaboration between mangrove expert, academic, uh, representative local and uh, national official governments the local NGO and also a local communities. So the proposal submitted will be uh, assigned whether it's approved, additional required, or maybe rejected. And this MEE permit will vary for 10 years and it is uh, renewable. So MEE policy mangrove also has some consequences and although challenging implementation. For consequences, for example, it will be mangrove resources center in Papua province. Uh, this is mandatory from this uh, policy paper. So we are hoping that everyone who wishes to study mangrove could come to West Papua to mangrove resource center and we uh, had some coordination. Uh, mangrove human resources development, it could come from formal, informal, and non-formal education. For example, mangrove focus, vocational school, and it could be closely related to the engagement with the local university of Melbourne and this area. For example, uh, faculty of Reste University of Papua. And the other consequences, for example, funding support and availability, it could come from a green funding, green development donor, special autonomy funding, and also a peace village funding from the central government. And the challenging implementation will be socialization to all stakeholders 
either local, regional, and national official governments, and also disseminating and preparing the local communities, ensuring funding, benefit, and outcomes to the local communities. And this picture shows mangrove land use change in other part of uh, Papua. This occurred in uh, Papua province. So we can see from picture number one, this illustrates the land use chain of mangrove to marine infrastructure. And the second uh, picture, uh, so the local community for housing and the bottom on the number three picture uh, showing the local wisdom of planting mangrove. Uh, in summary, I would like to uh, say that this MEE regulation will offer an authority to the local community to manage, utilize, and conserve the mangrove and coastal resources using the local knowledge as, and it is in direct uh, involvement to sustainable development based in West Papua province. MEE regulation will be a trust link between government and the coastal indigenous communities for any program, including climate change mitigation. Well, coordination, intensive communication, and wide collaboration could support, could support the success of the challenging implementation of MEE, even it could take, could take time and effort for all stakeholders involved. And this is the mangrove essential ecosystem regulation in West Papua. Uh, anyone who wish to uh, have this uh, electronic file can share it in Google. Thank you for listening. Time of back to Dr. Nina. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Bapa, for your updates uh, talk regarding to Eastern mangrove. So uh, local government policy support in collaboration with local scientists uh, can be critical for long-term mangrove sustainability, especially in Papua Islands, we believe it. And then uh, next, we will have our fourth uh, invitation speaker, Bapak Bambang Haryadi. Bapak Bambang Haryadi is a lecturer from graduate program of the Science Education, University of Jambi. He graduated from University of Jambi from Bogor Agricultural University and then also University of Hawaii in US. Uh, he got several awards such as a pillow of international uh, fellowship from Ford Foundation for PhD program and art and science award from the University of Hawaii. The other award from the Obuchi UNESCO scholarship. And the last, he got the US Civilian Research and Development Foundation's uh, research grants uh, from the, the among award that he received is uh, really prestigious. So uh, we expect uh, your presentation will be 50 minutes also. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Bambang Haryadi. Silahkan Bapak uh, for your presentations. Okay. Can you hear, hear me, Mbak Nina? Yeah, it's uh, very clear. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I thank the seminar committee for give me opportunity so I can share uh, the set of my my research in this uh, seminar. As already mentioned by the previous speaker from Prof. Kono and then Pak Hanan, Pak Harry, and Pak Kwasan, uh, it's already brought a general perspective in terms of pitland. And now I will discuss uh, pitland from educational perspective. As already mentioned earlier, that uh, Indonesia is one of the country that have a vast area of uh, tropical pitland. And in Indonesia, most of the pitland 
are distributed mainly in the three islands, which is uh, Sumatra, Kalimantan, and Papua. And in Jambi, the peatland is mostly uh, occur in the east coast, particularly in the three kabupaten, which is East Tanjung Jabung, Mauro Jambi, and West Tanjung Jabung. Natural peatland are a habitat for a number of animal and plant species, including some species that uh, consider as a rare species. Peatland also provide a number of benefits for human, including ecosystem services, such as for water regulation, water purification, erosion control, and also play a role in maintaining uh, climate stability. The peatland that have been left untouched are starting to be clear in line with the increasing population and economic growth. Peatland are mainly converted to palm oil and acacia plantation. Most of the peatland are degraded, degraded so they are very vulnerable to damage, especially to forest fire. First on peatland to increase in terms of its intensity and frequency over time. The long dry season is almost identical with forest fire here in Jambi. Several fires occur repeatedly at the same area. We are lucky that in the last two years that the rainfall is almost evenly distributed throughout the year so it can prevent the peatland from a fire. Various efforts have been made to prevent and control forest fire on peatland, including those initiated by BRJ with 3R, which is revegetation, revetting, re and revitalization of uh, social economy for the local people. However, these efforts are still not effective in preventing pit forest fire. One of the reasons is the low of community participation and knowledge associated with the peatland. The lack of uh, knowledge about peat, for example, occur in uh, periods in the East Tanjung Jabung Regency. Uh, a couple years ago, a group of young people grill cassava on a clear peatland. The fire just eventually burned the peat around the site, and the fire uh, finally completely be stopped after a week of the uh, day. The most effective way to prevent fire on peatland is to maintain a water table. Revetting by building a canal blocks uh, needs to be accompanied by a comprehensive water management, as already give uh, example by Pak Kozan in Riau. Uh, stakeholders, including the younger generation and local community, need to understand peatland well. For this reason, systematic peatland education is needed including employing the local school. We conducted research on the knowledge and perception of junior high school here in Jambi. Uh, there are some interesting findings from this study. First, in general, student knowledge about PEAT is considered in the low category. The second, student who come from PEAT farmer family doesn't necessarily mean that they also have good knowledge about PIP. And the third, students who have a lot of experience directly interact with peatland generally also have a good knowledge about the peatland. And finally, students who have a good perception about the peatland also tend to have a good knowledge about the PIP. Some other funding from the research uh, show that Farmers who are working on the peatland are generally migrants who come from other areas which is non-peatland area. Their knowledge about peat uh, just uh, slightly develop. They just learn about peatland when they start to cultivate the peatland. To implement a sustainable peat development, we recommend to include peat material in learning in school. This effort can be carried carry out through three scenarios here. The first is provide a specific subject about peatland, add learning topic to the existing subject, and the last one is enrich peatland to the current subject. Here is the detailed description of the scenario. Status quo means 
uh, we maintain the current learning system. The first scenario, we add a new subject about peatland. This scenario is, is expected to have students with high and comprehensive knowledge about peatland. The second scenario is adding a learning topic to the current subject. It is expected that this scenario will come out with students who have medium and high knowledge about peatland. And the last scenario is enriching peatland material into the current subject, especially science subject. It is expected that student will come out uh, their knowledge about uh, knowledge about peatland in the medium level. From the three scenario, it seems that the last option is the most makes sense. It doesn't require curriculum revision nor special teacher. It just require teaching training programs so that they can uh, smoothly integrate the pit material into their current teaching. The teacher could employ, for example, project-based learning or problem-based learning in order to reach, uh, to enrich their learning with the pit land. There are some topics uh, in the current science class, for example, here in junior high school for seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade that can be enriched by the uh, pitland material. And also for the senior high school, uh, there are subjects mainly uh, for biology, physics, and chemistry that can be enriched with uh, pitland material. Well, uh, to conclude my talk this morning, uh, effective pit conservation needs to be carried out comprehensively in fast area, for example, using a pitland hydrological unit and in the long term. And good knowledge about PEAT is required for all stakeholders, including children and students who will become the implementer and the policy maker for the future. And PITLAND learning needs to be carried out more systemic, systematically, one of which is including it as learning material in school. In the case of PEAT material in school learning is realistic option that doesn't require many requirements. And the last one, this, op this effort can be implemented through policy in the field of education, especially targeted for some school located in the pitland areas. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for your informative talk, uh, Bapak Doctors Bambang. As you mentioned before, uh, we believe effort to teach uh, pitland to young generation must be more systematic in the curriculums because education is one of powerful tools for affecting local community and also global community change. Then, uh, that's all right, Ibu dan Bapak. We already uh, hear like uh, five presentations for invited speaker and one kind keynote speakers. Then so we now have more than 20 minutes of the questions and answer. Uh, please, if you have any question, you can open your microphones and please address your question to who you will be uh, appropriate persons and include your name and institution. But uh, first uh, opportunity we will give to Kono Sensei uh, sensei, do you have any question or remark or anything to the all of the presenter? Please, uh, Sensei. Hello, Kono Sensei. Oh. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. <Sensei. laughs> yes. Thank you very much for inviting me to, and then uh, through three presentations I ran that. Uh, during the last 10 years, I understand that in Indonesia, various how can I say, challenges to restore or to recover the peatland and the mangrove uh, ecosystems. And I think that the, now we can find some solution, like, like Podans and Pope clearly suggests that the, even though it is a, still a small scale, uh, how can I say, people, local people start to accept the new new models of of of, of peatland restoration that they, it's quite I think interesting, and uh, and they try to find a way by themselves, 
And I think that the, such kind of movement can be disseminated to, to many areas. Then I think that the, you, you, may, you may be able to achieve bet, much better uh, ecosystems of peatland and the mangrove in the future. That is what I learned from this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kono Sensei, for your uh, short <laughs> talk. Uh, next, uh, we will call Fukuhara Sensei. Sensei, do you have any question to the presenter or you have some uh, remark uh, for this uh, seminar? Please, uh, Fukuhara Sensei. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, very clear, sense. Yeah, uh, I have some com comment on the remarks, but I I want to reserve to the concluding remarks. <laughs> well, I I yeah I prepare some, but if I open everything here, I I have nothing left in what to speak in the concluding. So <laughs> let me skip this time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe later sensei will have the closing remark, right? Uh, yeah. Next, uh, we would like to invite the chair of this seminar, Professor Wahyu. Professor Wahyu, do you have any questions or any remark to the presenter, please? Uh, yeah, first of, all, first of all, I would like to thanks for uh, the keynotes speaker and invited speaker and with their very uh, nice presentation. And also uh, we hope that uh, by invited uh, Dr. Hanan from, from Bapanas so we can uh, deliver our policy paper to Bapanas and, and, and the Bapanas will be considered our policy paper. That's my wish. Uh, thank you. I don't have any question. Um, anyway, um, keynote speaker and invited speaker can ask each other if you like to. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Okay, thank you, Prof. Wahyu, for a short remark. Uh, Bapak dan Ibu, uh, if you have any questions, Please open your microphone and you can address your question to the presenters. Uh, anyone here have a questions from Brin or from Kyoto University or from uh, Riau University or from I uh, hear here also from Tanjung Pura University, the other from Lambung Mangkurat University. Any others? Uh, scientists of Indonesia, do you have question? Or any presenter, do you have question each other? Like uh, the uh, Professor Wahyu said, probably uh, Kozan Sensei have question to uh, Pak Hanan or uh, the others, uh, Pak Harry have question to Pak Bambang or any, any questions or any comments for the presentation, please. You can open your microphone. Thank you, Bu, uh, Nina san. Yep. So I have one, one question to Dr. Bambam Hariyadi. Yeah, so uh, in my project, uh, we uh, try to include uh, elementary school students and, and uh, include uh, the university student. So I hope, uh, yeah, now, I'm not a specialist about education, so I a little bit difficult to uh, discuss with local uh, elementary school students about uh, Pitran problem. So we just uh, yeah plant uh, indigenous species uh, together or uh, discuss how to prevent fire. So please, uh, if you have uh, idea how to include more in detail or uh, to, yeah. yeah, I just talk about usually uh, 
Oran, Oran, Oran Daira, Oran, Oran Village, and Oran Tuba. It means more than 30 years, 20 years old people. So, and, so please uh, give me some suggestion or uh, comment. Okay, please, uh, Bapak Dr. Bambang, do you have any okay. suggestion? Or... Mbak Dina, can you help me? So the power in my home just uh, off for a couple of minutes, so I missed the middle part of the Pak Kozan question. Uh, yeah, Pak Kozan asked uh, you suggestion regarding to the uh, program in the elementary school, right, Sensei? Uh, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How the maybe how the method to approach the student, the, the small kid. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pak Kozan. So I would like to suggest that the education is defined based on the level of the student. Mm -hmm. So when we create a student for elementary school, maybe <clears throat> different from uh, a junior high school or high school. Mm -hmm. And for elementary school, for example, actually, uh, we just give a little bit knowledge while mm -hmm. playing. So they, they are not feel really learning, but playing, mm -hmm. but learning something. So, for example, making a game based on pitland, things like that, maybe. So, yeah, but, uh, yeah. for the high senior high school, might be different. Maybe that is my idea. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, yeah. Some I ask elementary school to uh, check their uh, health condition. So, more than five years ago, at that time, unfortunately, they are reply the answer is it was very difficult to analyze as a scientific data <laughs> so yeah maybe my approach was very very bad so uh, yeah so um, maybe i need to discuss more uh, you or uh, other yeah specialist <laughs> i'm you. happy if you have a chance to visit jambi sometime yeah yeah, yeah. Bye, bye. thank you thank you Thank you, Sensei and Bapak Dr. Bambang. Maybe Bapak Hanan, do you have any question to the others? Oh. Um, I'd like to respond to Pak Wahyu, Professor Wahyu Bianto. Uh, 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 we know that uh, oh, probably many research, good research, are uh, being carried out by uh, researchers in universities in the brain, uh, etc. Uh, but probably we don't know exactly or uh, and, and, uh, um, enough about those research because uh, the information are not uh, come to like uh, our office. Uh, now is the momentum of the time that uh, we, we, we have already had the presidential regulation about the SDGs and we have ratified the uh, Paris Agreement and we are now uh, developing the Indonesia uh low carbon and net zero emission or where uh, uh and mangrove can have uh, uh, important uh programs or goals so i think it is now the time to promote more about the pit line and please uh, contact us and please uh, provide us with uh, uh, easier, simpler to understand rather than the very uh, the academic uh, concept uh, so that we might uh, bring them and put them in the next uh, national um, long-term development planning to zero 25 to 20, 20, uh, uh, 2045. That's also our hope, so we can uh, make a, a better 
uh, a more communication about it. Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Hanan. Yes, we will make uh, more simple about the policy paper and, uh, and will be delivered to you. <laughs> Try to make a simple. Yeah, perfect. maybe. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Hanan from Bapenas and also from Wahyu from Brins for the good TikTok questions and the uh, I think it's like uh, uh, informal agreement between us to, <laughs> to continue this kind of the program Bio Village. Okay, uh, any other presenter that you have a question here? Uh, okay, then let me have uh, one question about uh, indigenous knowledge to Pak Heli. Okay. That uh, to what extent, because of the indigenous knowledge, is a different one place to another, according to the difference of the biodiversity and the ecosystem condition. So to what extent the indigenous knowledge in the different places are being archived as a compared? Simply because the, the, the indigenous knowledge for sustainable management of the ecosystem does not necessarily work on another place, although it looks similar, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Do you have any? Hello, Paheri. Okay. Paheri, <laughs> are you here? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, no, please uh, your comment to uh, Pahara Sen. Uh, sorry, ya. Tadi ada sedikit masalah nih, Pak. Ini connectionnya dan saya sedikit dulu. Apa bisa di Can you repeat the the comment or question? Then uh, I will... My question is that to what extent uh, the indigenous knowledge on the sustainable use of the peat and the mangroves are being archived in a different places? Oh. Because I, I said the one uh, the indigenous knowledge in the one place is a different from the other place. Mm. And the, and the indigenous knowledge and the practice for a certain place does not necessarily work on another place because of the natural condition is slightly different. Yeah. So sometimes okay. we can we can we can generalize, you know, mm. the use usefulness of the the indigenous knowledge. But it features a very, very restricted uh, locality. It's yeah. also the future, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. I agree with you, uh, Fukuhara, Professor Fukuhara. But I think uh, in my experience, mm. actually, the local knowledge is still alive or using or implementation if there is or there are uh institution just like ngo or academic or university who are still working with the uh what with with the, with the local people yeah mm. uh, okay I, I don't have really a good example the local knowledge related with the mangrove and peatland yeah mm. by research but i have experience just like for disaster risk reduction or uh, uh, climate change adaptation, mm -hmm. just like in Aceh, mm -hmm. they successfully uh, bring the local knowledge they call smong to the local re regulation. Yeah, why? Because there is uh, the group of academician still working with government to uh, to what this I mean to to heighten yeah the research for policy yeah that i found the in the disaster risk reduction issues yeah but mm -hmm. uh, i don't have any experience related ah, okay. with, uh, yeah but but maybe uh, like my colleague from papua or from mm -hmm. kalimantan have good experience how to how to link the local mm -hmm. knowledge into the, the the practices or the into the program in in government yeah uh, do you have any plan to correct the, the different indigenous knowledge from 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 here and there? 
to to have you know to develop some kind of the database to be shared uh, to yeah 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 uh i think as i mentioned earlier i i don't have a good database yeah, yeah, if, if yeah. I talk about the local knowledge in the uh pitland yeah mm. uh, but i think if in disaster risk reduction mm. uh issues i have yeah and mm. that just like in palu or in uh, aceh yeah uh, there is a good database related with the uh, local knowledge that implement for mm. the uh, government program Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Terima kasih yang dapat hari ini. Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Harry, and also uh, Fukuhara Sensei. And I will read one question from chat box addressed to Dr. Bambang. Dr. Bambang, are, are you still join us? Yes, I'm okay. in. <laughs> yeah, in the chat book, this from Sari Deviana. She asks, uh, do you have... Uh, do you do you suggestion the uh, material of pitland in the school uh, is there implementation in junior high school and senior high school in jambi maybe you have uh, any example in jambi project or something you can explain okay thank you ibu sari delfiana so some teacher who are creative is already tried to start to enrich the learning material with uh, pitland. And there are some publication also. Uh, maybe if you are interested, I can share. Like a teacher in West Kalimantan, if I'm not mistaken, she also have started to uh, integrate uh, pit into the learning material, especially in China. So there are many subjects. Uh, just give you example, maybe the most uh, closely related uh, dealing with the topic of uh, climate change or global warming. So this is a very good example that easily connected people who what is experience with forest burn, with haze, with smoke, then it's easy to open their uh, eyes about the importance of peatland. So that is maybe uh, one of the subjects that can be enriched too. There are many some other topic that can be uh, linked to the pitland. That's all for me, Mbak Nina. Okay, thank you, Pak Bambang, for your explanation. Right now, we have the Pak Wahyu, uh, Professor Wahyudi. He, he will address some question to the other presenter. Pak Wahyudi, are you still joined with us? Yes, okay. I am here. Please, Dr. Nina, yes, thank you very much for the times. Uh, my question is goes to Pak Bambang. So thank you very much for your very exciting uh, information and also presentation. So my first question is uh, about how long have you uh, you been thought of elementary involvement in pitland uh, restoration in in your place have been conducted for how long? And the second question is, what uh, plant species are being planted by the student? Yeah, that's all my question. Thank you. Okay, please, Pa Bambang, you can uh, give a comment or answer. Okay, thank you, Pa Wahyudi. So we didn't work with students in terms of restoration yet for this time, but we're still in the process of doing research about uh, education that associated with plan. Like this time, we are in the middle of doing the research, like collect information, what the student know, what their perception, also their parent. Maybe after the, in the future, after we collect enough information, then we can define what is the most appropriate program to involve students in the restoration program. Maybe that's all, Pak Wahyudi. Okay, thank you. Pak Wahyudi, do you have any comment, other? Here in the picture, do you know the idea, plant species? What, what kind of tree or something? 
Yeah, maybe like Pak Kozan already mentioned, to some degree, the species is almost as the same as in Riau. Oh. For example, in Jambi, we have like uh, Jelutung, Jelutung Rawa, mm. mostly, yeah. And also, uh, what is Kulai, is the most common species here. And there is a more prominent species with its high value, uh, species with its ramen, but what you did. But it's almost rare here. Okay. Thank you very much, Pak Bambang. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bapak Wahyudi and Pak Bambang. Uh, for another participant, do you have any question to keynote speaker or the uh, invited speaker? You can open your microphones or you can type your question in the chat box. But Nina, while waiting for another participant for question, uh, can I have a question or suggestion to the Pak Wahyudi? Maybe uh, Pak Wahyu, yeah, Prof Wahyu, I'm sorry, and maybe Prof Hanan, yeah. In terms of education, yeah, actually, there, as I mentioned earlier, some creative teacher and maybe some NGO already start to educate people about uh, uh, Pitlan. So I was wondering whether like my suggestion in the last part of my talk is could be uh, followed, followed it up. So it can became it can become a really policy. So like uh, school, mainly like in the pitland area. So they start to learn about pitland. So I do believe that if a student have a good knowledge, good understanding about peatland, that it will contribute in protecting the peatland in the future. Okay, thank you. Any comment from Pak Hanan or Pak Wahyudi? Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, your advice, Pak Bambang. Yeah, actually, I would like to, I would like uh, to adapt your uh, proven uh, your experience uh, in helping early education in our uh, curriculum, uh, not only in our university, but in our community as well. Because you know that uh, West Papua province has committed to uh, carry a sustainable development. But the understanding of sustainable development is not uh, is not everybody understand. I Meaning from the children to the young and to the older generation, they have different perspective, different opinions. So we have to deliver to all level of uh, age and also yes. This this my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Wahyudi, Pak Bambang. Pak Hanan, are you still with us? Do you have any comment? Oh, oh, probably he already left us. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have finally reached the end of this uh, section of seminar. our seminars. We would like to thank uh, the presenter for the very informative and interesting talk, as well as the audience for their active participation through the like uh, mod, uh, rich three hour we already have seminars. So hopefully everyone will benefit from this presentation. Uh, next, the Mr. Agus will present the certificate to all of the uh, speaker in this seminar. Please, Mr. Agus. This is addressed to Bapak Insinyur Hana Nugroho, Bapak Dr. Heri Yugaswara, then to uh, Dr. Osamo Kozan, next to Professor Wahyudi Oso.
Okay, the last one to Dr. Bambang Haryadi. The committee will send to you all of the certificates. So thank you for your attention. Uh, arigato gorjai masta. Terima kasih dan selamat siang. I will return the event to Miss Helen. Thank you very much, Bunina, for moderating this event very well. Uh, well, the next agenda is the last session. It is the closing remark from Mr. Ryuichi Fukuhara from Japan ASEAN Science, Technology and Innovation Platform, JASTIP Program Coordinator. To Fukuhara Sensei, time and screen are welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, distinguished guests and speakers and the participants, uh, it's really more honor that I deserve that I conclude this productive, fascinating, and encouraging online seminar. Almost one year ago, JSPS Alumni Association of Indonesia and the Dr. Warfield's leadership organized a kickoff seminar on the integrated action based on the biobased concept, in which I delivered the concluding, concluding remarks. Then the research team members carried out their own research activities and the teams expanded the scope to the management policy of the peat and the mangrove, setting the today's seminar theme. So I congratulated you on the successful kickoff last year. And again, I commend the progress made since then, even though we are all still in a difficult situation under the COVID-19 pandemic. In today's session, I found it very interesting that may be our clue for, on the way forward. And that is almost the same with the Professor Kono's comment. Although the title of today's seminar is policy, but all invited speakers emphasize the importance of local communities, indigenous narratives, and daily subsistence in the peatland and mangrove ecosystem. Policy, as you know, is in general developed and administered by those who are away from the ground. So our speaker's emphasis on the kind of locality and the indigenousness of the peat and the mangrove implies that current possible sustainable management for the peat and the mangrove is not inclusive enough to reflect the reality and challenges on the ground. So please don't misunderstand. I'm not criticizing the current Indonesia's governmental policy for the peat and the mangroves. It's still weak and insufficient and ineffective. On the contrary, I really respect your effort. And, and I'm impressed that Indonesia is trying to bear the global responsibility for the climate change as one of the nations which possesses largest territorial and oceanographic carbon storage in the world. But having said that, the linkage of the local people and local action with the national and global policy is not enough due to several reasons. And so of course, it's very difficult to say, easy to say, but very, very, very difficult to implement. So I don't want to list up the, all those reasons now, but definitely we have to admit there is a still gap or there may be many gaps here and there. And personally, I think, if we continue the conventional way of the policy making and as much as we want. I mentioned in last year in the seminar, bio-village concept has the potential to prototype an efficient and effective out-of-the-box solution for the complex problem solving process. And I've learned today on go on a mobile application presented by engineer Pak Hanan from Bapenas is a good example. Hereby we also learn today where our innovative idea to apply fill the gap. And not only the out of the box solutions. We have drawn more and more from our ancestors' knowledge and wisdom. I can call it out of the memory or out of the straight solution, which has been marginalized 
by modern science for a long time. So indigenous knowledge presented by Pakhari and Pakwas were generation to generation. So what is necessary to mix both in a proper way? Here is a question. Well, Dr. Kozan presented a good example using the watershed information, incorporating the information from the local villagers. And also he recommended mixed cultivation to take balance between the economic benefits and environmental conservation. And of course, to, to develop the good mixed policy, we have to still know more and more about the peat plant and share such knowledge, not only within the expert, but also with the wider population, with the policy makers, with the non-experts for local villagers and younger generation, sometimes through the formal education as presented to Dr. Bambam Hariardi at the Jambi case. It's really important. We not only now, in the future, we have to manage and utilize the, the benefit and of the mangrove, the peatland, and we have to leave to the next generation and the next generation. Uh, so I'd like to stop here. <laughs> I, I think I said enough. And, and most Japanese don't work on these days in the mid August, honestly. So thank you for the Otani Sensei, Kondo Sensei, and uh, Kodan Sensei. The mid August is important for our Japanese culture because it tells us our ancestors' spirits come back from home and stay with us for a few days. Then we send them back to another world tomorrow, 16th August. So it's our tradition that we still follow to reconfirm our family ties. And in addition, today, 15th August, is a memorial day we surrendered in the World War II, 77 years ago. So two days after we surrendered, on 17th August 1945, you declared independence and started your own fighting to establish your own country. So looking back at history, we've been so interconnected, and now we really appreciate Indonesia and Japan together tackling the common challenge on the Petra and the mangrove for the global environmental crisis. So last but not least, let me congratulate on your Independence Day for the, next, the two days later, and let us continue to move forward together and let us start a new chapter of the story and the history of lava coexistence with the peatland and the mangrove ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the excellent and warm closing remark, Fukuhara Sensei. Uh, before we, uh, and this is the certificate as a closing mm. remark. Ah, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, before we close this event, it is better to take a picture to uh, to take a picture and I asked to the committee for help to take a picture too so uh, the the result is clear. To all the participants, please uh, can open the camera. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, let's get to today's closing session. We say thank you very much again to uh, Otani Sensei, Kono Sensei, all speakers, Insinyur Hanan Nugroho, Dr. Harry, Kozan Sensei, 
Pak Wahyudi PhD, Dr. Bambang Haryadi, and also to Fukuhara Sensei, Prof. Wahyu, and Bu Nina. I also thank you to the committee for having me as a MC for this event. Uh, for more and less, I say uh, apologize. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. See you again. See you again, Sensei.